I should have known. I shouldn't have been so resistant. Then this other little kid said to his mom, why doesn't Mackie talk? Wendy came out and told me the diagnosis. And then Wendy cried all the way home in the car. As a mother of two boys, thinking one in 54 boys are affected with autism spectrum disorder in this country is shocking. It's shocking for researchers. It's really important to go and volunteer and raise your hand and say, I can help move science forward because that's how science works. In public health, we're about prevention. What we want to do is prevent this. Just like polio in the U.S. is a disease of the past, that's what we want to have happen to developmental disabilities in children. When we first got a diagnosis that Mackie was on the autism spectrum, I mean, it's, it's a pretty hard thing to swallow. I just flat out wouldn't accept it. I guess I was so resistant to the idea of him having autism because I just didn't see that in my child. He just seemed like a sweet little boy who needed a little bit of help. When someone tells you your kid's on the autism spectrum, a huge amount of that thought just crashes on you. And you, you can't help but imagine the worst. Sarah, time to get up. So I always say that Sarah has clearly some disabilities, but her sense of humor <laughs> is not disabled. And so she's a very funny kid. I can give you my cold you know that, don't yeah, you? Yeah, I don't want your cold sex. Exactly! <laughs> when Sarah was diagnosed 18 years ago, we didn't really understand a lot about autism, about the causes, about the natural history, what the possibilities were. And I always thought that looking back when she was diagnosed and thinking there's just not the quality of research that we need, and there's not the m multiplicity of, of backgrounds and viewpoints that, that we need to do to figure out this disease. This is Sarah's mom, right? Mm -hmm. That's Wendy. Wendy did not like having her picture taken, remember that? She didn't. I think she photographed just nicely, though. I think she did, too. I miss her. I miss her, too. Yeah. Well, you're doing really well. Right? She would be very proud. She was all about love, huh? When Wendy died, and she died suddenly, I had to decide how we would uh, memorialize her. I decided that because she was so devoted to children, especially uh, children with developmental disabilities, that we would form a center. The Wendy Clegg Center really takes the public health perspective of, while it's important to understand and improve treatment, it's also important to understand cause, which means that you can improve prevention as well as treatment. My research has focused on the causes of autism when you take the genetic perspective and the environmental perspective together. If we could understand the causes of autism and the right moments that genetic predisposition connects with the right kind of environmental trigger, we would know a lot more about how to prevent or how to intervene early and with what kinds of tools, whether they be behavioral or um, pharmaceutical or otherwise. And that's a very difficult issue because Right now, we don't know whether it's in utero exposure to the child or, or exposure to the parents that may affect the germ cell line and that influence the children. If you look at a plot of the rise in the rates of autism in the CDC studies amongst eight-year-olds, seven and eight-year-olds, you'll see this dramatic exponential increase in the number of children with such a diagnosis. And this is extremely concerning for all sorts of reasons. Who wants to go to the zoo? Me! Mackie? He is a, a interesting little boy. I think his biggest issue is that he really wants to be social. He wants friends, he wants to play with everyone, 
He wants everyone to share his love of birds, and he just can't figure out how that's supposed to work. I can lament the fact that he's not the most popular kid on the playground, that he doesn't have enough play dates, that he doesn't, you know, he's not good at making new friends, that he only really plays with his siblings. You're supposed to say they're going to grow up to be whoever they are going to grow up to be. But you still kind of want your kids to grow up to be a superhero. I think everybody who has children has dreams, has aspirations and dreams. And, and when you receive a diagnosis like that, that's a wake-up call that maybe those dreams and aspirations aren't appropriate to the child. And then you have to redefine uh, what your aspirations are. For us, the aspirations always were that Sarah would, would surpass any expectations that especially health professionals had for her because they were always, uh, always saying what she wouldn't be able to do and what she could not be able to do. Without a doubt, the biggest challenge we had to face was what do we do if we have another kid who's on the spectrum? My wife was diagnosed with twins via ultrasound and uh, then the world sort of closed in on me and my vision went black and I don't remember the next three days. One of the studies that we carry out at the center is called EARLY, E-A-R-L-I, for Early Autism Risk Longitudinal Investigation. And this study follows families from the time a family knows that they're pregnant till that child becomes three. It was just really important for us to, like, you know, if there is a risk of autism in the family, we should do everything we can um, to help research. We're interested in understanding cause, and we care about genes and environment. That means we have to um, convince folks to get on board with us, and that often means donating blood or some kind of biological sample for which we can do genetics work. Um, that also means understanding what someone's environment is like. So I'm here to conduct your first home visit. It should take about 30 minutes or so. Okay. On um, the first step, I'm going to get a dust sample from your home. It was exactly what I kind of wanted someone to do for this kind of thing. You want to know about prenatal development. You want to know about, you know, uterine conditions. You want to know about the condition of a placenta. You want to know about what did mom eat for breakfast every day of her pregnancy. You want to throw a huge net and grab as much data as you possibly can. They had the twins come in every few months to do developmental tests. Nora always tested out fine. They let us know early on with Liam, probably at like his six month research date that there were red flags. We were really afraid watching his early development that he was gonna go down the same path as Mackie. The early interventions I think were monumental in helping Liam. One critical area in um, autism research and public health research in autism right now is understanding what happens to children as they become adults on the spectrum. I am actually nervous about the idea of Malachi as an adult. You worry about, like, you know, will he ever have, you know, friends? Will he make it through college? Will he be able to, you know, live on his own and have bills paid on time? And you don't know. One of the most difficult things I think about a child with a disability, any kind of disability, for the parent is, how do I build a framework that helps this kid survive after I'm not here? Public health really is the place to go to understand which services work, which ones are being used, if they're not being used, why? And that is extremely important for families who are affected, for the children and adults affected with this disorder to be able to maximize their potential um, and minimize the burdens uh, on themselves, their families, and their communities um, because of the disorder. We need people working on the etiology, understanding what are the exposures that maybe interact with genes to, to lead to these kinds of problems. How do you diagnose them early? What, what are some possible strategies towards prevention? We know early intervention helps. Are there other strategies we should be taking? And then how do these kinds of issues in families affect families? How do we come up with the policies that we need to support children and families? This is a problem that is screaming out 
to be solved, a problem that the Wendy Clagg Center is perfectly suited to investigate because we owe it to the children.